broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Woodstock, Georgia, it's time for Cherokee Business Radio. Now, here's your host. Welcome to Cherokee Business Radio. Stone Payton here with you this morning. And today's episode is brought to you in part by Alma Coffee, sustainably grown, veteran-owned, and direct trade which, of course, means from seed to cup, there are no middlemen. Please go check them out at MyAlmaCoffee.com and go visit their Roastery Cafe at 3448 Holly Springs Parkway in Canton. Ask for Harry or the brains of the outfit, Leticia, and please tell them that Stone sent you. All right, you guys are in for such a treat this morning. Please join me in welcoming to the broadcast. First up on Cherokee Business Radio this morning, with Jane Gentry and Company, the lady herself, Miss Jane Gentry. Good morning. Good morning. It is a delight to have you in the studio. How about we start with a little bit of a, an overview, mission, purpose? Uh, what are you out there trying to do for folks, Jane? Uh, we are out there trying to help CEOs uh, and executives of businesses up to about $200 million grow. Uh, some of our clients are growing rapidly. They don't know that they have the right infrastructure to support that growth. Uh, we have a lot of owners that are trying to exit after COVID. We want to make sure that they've got the systems intact to, uh, so their businesses can continue without them or they can sell for a profit if that's what they choose to do. So it sounds like a tall order to me. <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun to me. I don't. <laughs> so, so, so where do you start with? So it, it seems like a, a great big thing that you're tackling. Where, where do you start? Um, we start with the leader. Frankly, um, we start with the CEO. Most of my consulting is to the CEO. Um, and we take a look at uh, their leadership of the organization places where they might improve, and listen a lot to what they think the challenges are that they have in the organization. Then we go back in there and dig in and figure out if we agree with them uh, in terms of the priorities of, of what they think are the challenges in the business. So I've, I've always wondered, what does that look like when maybe the, the leader's perception is different than, than the reality you're observing and or they're just not um, equipped or prepared to um, have that real conversation. Are, yeah. Do you run into that sometimes? We have a lot of hard conversations and uh, in a loving way, Stone. <laughs> uh, but yeah, sometimes the leader is the challenge in the organization, mm. frankly. Uh, sometimes they don't, uh, sometimes they're grabbing too much to things that they maybe should let go of and let other people do. Uh, sometimes they don't have those people in the organization, and we need to look at the talent situation in the organization. Um, and then there are a lot of times where they think they need to start at a particular point, and we don't agree necessarily with that. And so um, there's some negotiating, uh, <laughs> some convincing on our side, some convincing on their side, and some negotiating about where's the right place to start. So uh, I suspect you see some patterns over time. You, you've been at this a while. Are, are there some things that you can almost count on seeing? And, and you probably have the social skills not to roll your eyes, but maybe internally you're like, okay, here we go again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the number one thing is I call chasing the shiny object. Mm. Chasing the things that are not the most critical to move the business forward. And I'll give you my favorite example. Uh, almost every time I get into an organization, somebody says to me, we need a new website. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'll say, okay, well, you know what? I agree with you. Your baby's ugly, uh, but that's not really where I would start. You need the strategy first, right? You need the, you need the plan first. Yeah. Uh, you need to know who your customer is first and what the language is of your customer and what the problems that your customer has. What are the solutions? You know, what are the things you're solving for? And then we get to the website. A website anymore is just a calling card, right? Nobody right. in B2B is going to buy off your website. But the, but the thing about uh, something like that is that you get it, you get something metaphorically to hold in your hand at the end of it that you can be proud of. 
it's and some of the harder business challenges are a process and you it's harder to find that thing that you can hold in your hand and go look at what we did isn't this beautiful isn't this website beautiful isn't this collateral beautiful right so um i call it chasing the shiny object and that is a that is a pretty consistent thing that that i see i i think i might resemble that remark <laughs> <laughs> and we're nowhere 200 million, but we got a good little business going yeah, here. And I, yeah. I, yeah, I get, I, and you know, I'm one of the leaders of this little business and I do get sort of uh, distracted by Johnny. Hopkins. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I had a CEO say to me recently, I'm not sure that our business uh, will be relevant in 10 years. Um, and then not too long on the tail end of that, she said, Jane, we, we really need a new website. And I said, wait, <laughs> I think we need to go back to the statement that your business might not be relevant in 10 years and address that. I think that's the big problem, <laughs> not not your website, right? So it, it is a pretty consistent, pretty consistent thing. So let's back up a little bit. I'd love to hear a little bit about the backstory. How did you land in this in this line of work? Um well, I had a consulting practice for 20 years. I consulted predominantly with very big companies, Mercedes, Home Depot, Philips. I've heard of those. Yeah, a couple of those. <laughs> um, and then I la I was uh, recruited to run a couple of companies, uh, to take a CEO role in a couple of companies, and uh, turn these people down, I don't know, 10 times, and ultimately uh, took the job and uh, with an equity-backed, they were equity-owned. Um, it, COVID aside, it was one of the worst experiences I have ever had. Everybody that ever mm. sold to this equity firm lost their money or didn't get their money. Um, it, it was really a, a pretty big bait and switch. And, uh, so I got, I left there and had, you know, kind of a, Heart to Jane and Jane had heart to heart <laughs> with each other. Uh, do, do you want to go back to what you were doing? And honestly, I was a little bored. In fact, a friend of mine had said uh, before I took this this role with the equity backed companies, uh, he said, "Jane, I think you're just putting different lipstick on the same pig." <laughs> and I thought that was really very southern, but very good advice, right? So. Um, what I realized is that that experience lit a fire under me. I do not want, if I can save one person stone, and this sounds, this sounds so like metaphysical and Jane thinks a, a whole lot of herself, mm. but honestly, if I can save one owner from an experience like that, it will be a win for my career. And so um, uh, my partner who's been doing this for, for quite a while and I uh, have just decided that's really what I'm passionate about is helping these owners uh, realize the things that they want in their business, realize that they can have a life and have a business, which is really hard to do, um, and that they can sell their business uh, and make money and not get not get ripped off like these poor owners that I that I got to know. So sometimes when you're going in, you're helping them get ready. For, for an, an exit. exit, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So do you ever run into a situation where the operation is, is, is generating pretty good revenue, mm -hmm. the sales side of it's okay, but they're just not nearly as, as profitable as they should and could be because some other things in the machine aren't working too well? Yes. We are in the, we're in the midst of uh, fixing a, fixing all the back end financials for an owner right now who inherited the company. Wow. And uh, there's no, there's no job costing. Uh, they don't know what their cost of goods sold is in the company. They don't have a process for estimating. Uh, they let their co clients send the contract to them out of, and they work with giant companies. So do you really want procurement from Disney? <clears throat> sending you the, the contracts is really not going to be in your best interest. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, so we're digging into that and helping that yeah. owner think about that business and, uh, how it makes sense to look at that business financially and how you can ensure 
your profitability and how you can look at some of the decisions you made and, and ask yourself, was that a really good decision or was that a poor decision? Right. So, um, yeah, sometimes, sometimes the money is there, but the profitability isn't there because some of the decisions that are being made aren't, aren't really in the best interest of profitability. So I am peripherally um, around some of the things that, that you're describing just because I get a chance to talk to business leaders. And a couple of things that come up a, a lot uh, is two different retention. Sometimes they have concerns, or at least they're focused on client retention, hanging on to who they have. But a lot of it, too, is hanging on to the to the employees. So that is the number one problem for every business on the planet right now. Yeah. Um, 30 million boomers left the market during COVID just said, I'm out of here. Wow. Uh, we bring in right now about 9 million new bodies into the workforce a year. And so a lot of owners are saying to me, Jane, people don't want to work. They don't want to work. And I say, no, honey, you have a math problem. You don't really, maybe people don't want to work for you and that's a different problem altogether, (laughs) right? right? But the, the overarching problem is a math problem. We have lost uh, 20 some million people out of the workforce. The birth rate Uh is going lower and lower and lower. So that problem is not going away. In addition to that, people did during COVID really take stock of who they work for. How do they feel about that? Uh, What do they want their work life to look like? I had somebody um, ask me the other day at a keynote, she said, something about work-life balance. I said, there's no such thing. There's just life balance, right? And people are looking at that now and are not accepting some things from their employers that they were willing to accept in the past. And so employers who are not willing to revisit uh, how they treat employees are going to be the losers, right? So so a couple, couple examples, somebody posted on LinkedIn yesterday and I just, I, I kind of cackled because uh, I was helping one of my nieces with this recently. She was applying for a job in a big company. So first off, those talent acquisition platforms are horrible uh, because they don't look at you as a person. They're looking for keywords in your resume. Yeah. Um, she submitted the resume and then the platform asks her to basically fill out again everything that's on her resume. <laughs> and that's and that's pretty common, but is that a way to treat is that a a way to show people that you value people in your organization? No, because you're wasting everybody's time, right? right? So that's that's just an an example that has happened recently. Um so we have to think about about that. If the employer is not in the driver's seat right now, you've got to be attractive to your employees and you've got to be willing to be flexible. I had a CEO say to me recently, well, the reason I don't let people work remotely, Jane, is because they refer to that as their day off, not their day at home. And I said, yeah, well, that's not them. That's you guys having poor management in your company, right? So what what this work at home thing has really illuminated is the lack of leadership that we have in organizations because you have to be an intentional leader when you lead remotely. You can't just pop by somebody's cubicle and look over their shoulder and see what they're doing and give some some input. You have to be really intentional about um, KPIs that you're asking them to meet and expectations that you have and when you're going to check in and ways that you're going to coach. So um, it really has required the level of leadership to be ratcheted up for people to be able to work remotely. And leaders have to start embracing that and digging in. Well, it's my understanding for those organizations who have done it well, who have done it right, they've really... Um gotten some tremendous benefit from having their workforce work at least part of the time remotely. Has that been your experience? It has to be the right people uh, in the right organization with the right expectations. Uh, Part of the other thing I think that leaders would get value from is revisiting the way work gets done 
in their company. And so when I talk to CEOs, I'll say to them, I don't want you to think about titles. We need this title and this title in our company. I want you to ask yourself, what is the work that happens in our company? And what are the ways we can get that work done? Um, but before we got on air, I told you I'd done work with Mercedes and yeah. the chief uh, HR officer for North America for Mercedes. I just love his brain, you know, and he, he go he tells the people in his organization, think about how that work can get done. Can it be job share? Can it be an intern? Can it be a mom that left the workforce that doesn't want to work full time? Can it be a boomer that retired that still wants to exercise their brain a certain amount of the week, right? Doing something uh, work related. Can it be um, a college student to be really frank with you, college students that are sophomores, Stone, are more equipped to enter the workforce today than you and I were, than I was probably in grad school, mm. uh, frankly. <laughs> so um, so we have to be creative about the way work gets done because the lack of talent is not going to go away. And, and when it comes to keeping the talent, after you've recruited properly, you've nurtured them, my instincts are that it's so often... Uh, so much more uh, about something beyond or other than money. Is that accurate? It, money is not the number one thing. Okay. Purpose is the number one thing. And people get all freaked out about that term. Uh, we talk about it a lot in leadership. But purpose is really just, look, to engage employees, they want to know three things. They want to know where we're going. They want a clear vision, a clear purpose for what we're doing. They want to know what their part is in that. They want to be able to see that they have a part in that. And they want some autonomy in their job in terms of getting the company to that, to that vision and living out that purpose. And purpose is really, you know, every, most companies, some executive somewhere writes the mission statement and the purpose statement. Uh, and it sits on a wall, maybe somewhere in a document. But a purpose statement is really should be the lens through which you make every decision for your business. That's, that's the point of a purpose statement. It, it makes all the sense in the world, and it sounds so simple when you say it. <laughs> yeah, it does. But it's not, which is why I have a job. <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank goodness it's not simple, or I would, I would uh, be working somewhere else. <laughs> so so when, when a company decides to engage your firm, what, what does the early part of an engagement look like? You're sitting down with them. It, it, can you kind of describe what happens in the early stages of an engagement? We do a lot, a lot, a lot of discovery. And then um, we do an assessment with the CEO and maybe some of the executive team called the judgment index. And that freaks everybody out because they're always like, so do I have judgment? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. We're going to find out. Um it really gives us some good insight into what's going on with a leader in terms of the the way that they uh, show up at work, but the way that some of the things, some of some of the ways that they see themselves or they see work in general impact how they show up at work. So, what what are you finding the most rewarding? What are you enjoying the most about the work? I love ahas. I, I've for 30 years, that's the thing that gets me up in the morning is for, uh, for a CEO, for a salesperson, for somebody to uh, have an aha moment that kind of course corrects maybe the way that they choose yeah. to do their work or to yeah. look at their work. Yeah. I get excited that, about that. I bet that is incredibly fulfilling. So it sounds like great work if you can get it. How does, but I'm curious, and, and I have, I play a, a pretty major sales role in our organization, so I'm always curious, how does the whole sales and marketing thing work for a company like yours, for a, for a practice like yours? Like how, do you, how do you get a chance to even have those conversations with CES? Yeah, so I'm knocking on the wood of your table. Uh, <laughs> my practice, even uh, before, so for 30 years, for 30 years, 20 some years, um, has been all referral. Wow. Um, very, very blessed that way. Yeah. But we also, you and I talked about um, uh, networking or, or whatever. I'm, I'm a believer in uh, helping. So I'm, 
I have a very large network of people, but I've spent a lot of time paying into that network, yeah. uh, doing my very best to help people succeed. And so the, the, the benefit of that is those people are willing to help help back. So I'm very lucky that way. But your radio show maybe won't hurt. And uh, I am invited on a lot of podcasts and yeah. things like that. So I'm out and about in the world or out and, out and about if you're Canadian. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so we're lucky that way. We are about to do a little bit of marketing, right. uh, but only because I think that's the right thing to do. Yeah, and you're out there speaking. You have an opportunity. I am to a speak keynote speaker, so okay. I speak quite a bit at sales and leadership conferences, in particular. Yeah, and please, because you know, sm- sm- small and mid-sized business owners are not out networking, right? They are head down in their businesses, and so uh, really, the only way to meet them is through referral or speaking at a conference that they that they choose to attend, because they're not. They're not out in the world having having the time to go to a networking meeting. Right. Yeah, I hear you. And um, as as you've clearly experienced, good work doing good work is a marvelous sales tool, isn't it? It's a great <laughs> sales tool, and it's a great um, way to spend your week. Just feels good. Uh, so our listenership is largely made up of. Um, People who are trying to strike out on their own and and create their own future, like the decision you made some years back. Uh, What counsel, if any, would you have to offer them if if they're considering it or they're in the early stages? I don't know if there was a a, a mistake you might have made or or something that surprised you or you came out of that with the three do's and three don'ts of getting your own thing going. But uh, any counsel you might have, I'm sure it would be greatly appreciated. Um, if you're if you're early on, you're very product focused, right? But we okay. and we're usually not working with little bitty companies. <clears throat> but I would say um, major on the majors. Don't chase the shiny object. Strategy, uh, you know. I don't know who said culture eats strategy for lunch. If you don't have a strategy, you're not going to have a culture. So you have to be a certain size for that culture eats strategy for lunch maxim to work. Um, major on the majors and strategy is the major. Execution comes behind that. Uh, the other thing is don't be uh, myopic in the in terms of just staying uh, so hyper-focused on your business that you're not out in the world networking. I I have found in my own business that um, the biggest accelerator of my business is my desire to be around smart people who challenge the way that I think. And for business owners, when you're, when you're in your business every day and that's, you show up in that building and you don't go anywhere else. um, Where do you, I mean, they get it from us, right? That's one of the ways we're the people that ask the hard questions and hold them accountable. But other than somebody like a consultant, business consultant, um, where, where do you get your thinking stimulated from? Who, who stimulates you? What do you read? Who do you listen to? Who do you go to lunch with? Um, you owe that to your employees and your culture and your business to, to kind of get outside your business. I am so glad I asked. And if I'm asked that question, I, and I will try to remember to credit you, but I am going to tell them to major on the majors. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> I, I love it. Uh, and then uh, I'd, I'd like to know um, how, I don't even know what questions to ask. If I were to, to begin shopping for, for lack of a better phrase, a consultant, like h- how, what kind of questions should you ask? What should you look for if you're considering engaging a consulting firm to come help you prep for the exit or just have a more profitable business? Or maybe you don't even know what the challenge is. You just feel instinctively, man, this could be so much better than what we're, we're doing here. But how would you go about engaging someone? Well, I think there are a lot of smart business consultants. There are a lot, you know, equally number of Look, we'll call them less smart. Um, but if you can get past the point of uh, credibility, then I think you should look at, um, do you trust this th- these people? Do you trust this person? Are you willing to um, be challenged by this person? Do they mm. challenge you? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, that is the value of a consultant is that they should be asking you hard questions. Uh, they should be challenging your thinking. Uh, and if they don't do that, then I would give them das boot uh, in favor of <laughs> somebody else. <laughs> But, you, but you've got to have the relationship, right? Because a person who does the kinds of things that we do, we're deep in your business. Um, we're, we're deep in, in, in conversations about your leadership and your, your leadership style, your leadership effectiveness. So the, the trust uh, in the relationship and, um, and the credibility, I think, are the two biggest two biggest things. What, what I'm hearing from you is look for those things, be prepared to try to, to, to ascertain and, and, and see if that really is the case with this organization or individual that you're considering engaging and look to yourself. And if you're not ready to participate in that way and be open and share, then, then you're, then that's just, it. you're not ready. Yeah. If you want somebody to just agree with you, I can maybe give you some recommendations. <laughs> Probably not going to be me. Um, but that's one of the reasons that we use that judgment index stone is yeah. um, because it really kind of bubbles up for us some issues that maybe some of the leaders had. And I'll tell you one thing that that used to really surprise me. The number one, uh, one of the top things that that index shows fairly regularly is a lack of self-awareness from leadership. So it, if you're not willing for somebody to tell you you're the emperor and you're walking around naked, as they say in the South, then you <laughs> probably don't, you're not ready for, for a business consultant. Got it. What a delightful conversation. Thank you so much for coming in and, uh, and sharing your story with us. If uh, someone out there would like to reach out and have a conversation with you or your partner or someone on your team, um, let's give them some, some points of contact, whatever you feel like is appropriate, a website, email, what, phone, what, whatever. What's the best way for them to reach out and connect? Uh, you can reach out to me directly at Jane at janegentry.com. Jane is not the fancy Jane. It's just J-A-N-E-G-E-N-T-R-Y. Uh, our number is 770-516-7758. Or you can find me on LinkedIn. I think my LinkedIn profile is actually Jane M gentry, but I'm not hard to find. Well, it's been an absolute delight having you on the show. Thank you again. I appreciate you. Yeah. How about hanging out with us while we visit with our next guest? I'd love to. All right, gang, you ready for the headliner? He's been very patient over there <laughs> and listening. I thought I even saw him taking some notes. I know I saw him taking some pictures, and you'll find out why here in just a moment. Uh, please join me in welcoming to Cherokee Business Radio with Armitage Photography, Inc., Mr. John Armitage. How you doing, man? I'm good. How are you doing? I am doing well. Well, did you learn anything in that last segment? I did. I did. I, I almost sometimes wanted to reach in and say a few things, but I thought, no, nah, I can't. Cause, uh, <laughs> but a lot of things she said ring so true um, about the business world and leadership. And, um, and you definitely have to self-assess a lot of the times uh, just to see where you are. And to you know, go forward all the time. It's one of the things that I love about doing this work, guys. If you ever want to to just meet some really smart people and occasionally get some really great thought leadership consulting coaching, uh, get yourself a radio show <laughs> and invite smart people to come visit with you. All right, so tell us about Armitage Photography. Uh, you're obviously out there taking pictures, but I bet there's more to it. Oh, yeah. there's uh, <laughs> Photography is a whole industry of various factions, I, I would say. Um, I mean, I've been shooting product photography for the last 35 years. So I've been doing it a long time. And you end up over that time shooting just about everything possible. <laughs> and uh, so there's nothing that comes my way nowadays that I don't say, oh, okay, this is how we're going to do that. And this is how we're going to do that. And a lot of it just takes a lot of experience. And, you know, as I, I, I also, one of my big passions is to mentor and intern uh, other photographers coming out of school. And right. one of the things I tell them is, you know, you have to fail all the time because if you, if you don't fail, that means you know everything. So you, you have to fail constantly to make sure that, um, you know, you are not making mistakes at the critical moment. So when you say product photography, mm -hmm. this could range from 
food to to widgets? Exactly. I yeah. do. I I do a lot of food. Um, I used to do a lot of work for racetrack gas stations, and I'm um, doing all their food. I have um, uh, Ole Mexican brand food is one of my current clients. So yeah. do a lot of tacos, and I've shot. <laughs> You're making me hungry, man. I can't tell you how many tortillas <laughs> I have shot. But uh, I mean, one of the one of the nice things about working with Ole is they've been uh, very good about afterwards. You know, we have all this product that um, we can't really restock. So I am have the ability to give it to you know food organizations. Uh, one of them is Lower oh, wow. Co-op, which is around where I live, and. Um, it was really hard to give away like two pallets of tortillas. I've got to tell you. <laughs> now, did you start out with a focus uh, on on product photography, or did you sort of migrate to that over time? Well, um, when I was younger, I wanted to be a photojournalist. Okay. And I, as I went to college, I actually went to photo school. There was an actual college for it uh-huh. uh, out in California, Cal State Fullerton, and um, so during that time you one of the requirements to graduate is to have an internship Ah. and so this is one of the reasons why i like to host interns as well but i went to a a guy named jack eden he's unfortunately passed away now but um he taught me a lot of things and it was one of those things where you walk in and go this is where i'm supposed to be this is what i want to do and i pursued it ever since and even in the face of many people going oh you shouldn't do that it's so hard it's so difficult but you know i just have the philosophy of if whatever it is you're going to do if you put yourself into it 100 percent and don't you know listen to these people that are telling you no in fact it just emboldens me more to say really you're going to tell me no no i can do it so <laughs> i just went on and on and and there's there are paths to take to get to certain levels and you know i've noticed each of those inclining paths um as i have worked and in the business and worked with other photographers and worked with studios uh, large studios and now that you know for the last 20 years i've had my own studio so it's over actually it's over norcross right off yeah. jimmy carter so do you find yourself working with someone in a marketing capacity in these firms? Are you working with the owner? Like, who are you interacting with at the company? Oh, it all depends on which company it is. Okay. Uh, for Ole Mexican Brown Foods, there's a nice gentleman named Enrique Botello, and he is their marketing person. Yeah. So he gets together with me, and we um, he tells me what they need, and I try to provide them the best way I can. Um, if it's because there's some just product shots that are that are just for the web for Amazon that are you know tortillas on a on a white sweep, um, not too exciting, but um, occasionally there is a, a better opportunity to do some more lifestyle type of shots where you know I have to I hire a food stylist. Uh, there's a lot of really good ones out there. Um, All but, right, you got to hit the brakes here. What? <laughs> What in the world does a food stylist oh do? Oh, my. Food stylists are women and men. I shouldn't say. I, I don't want to be sexist, but um, I'd say a majority of them are women. Uh, but a few very good men um, do this. And they really just make food look good. So, huh. so um, I, I don't know. They're, they can cook, and they make things look juicy and fresh, and um, they – have all kinds of little tricks of the trade to make the food look fantastic. And without them, you know, the photography is not going to look good. It's like we can't do food photography without them, and they can't get jobs as food stylists without (laughs) us. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, Rachel Daylong is uh, one of my favorite food styles out there, and I've used her several times on Ola Mexican Brand Foods shoots and she is just phenomenal she gets in and she sets everything up and has all her little accoutrements that she will put into to make it look fresh and and be fresh and uh so many times you just want to look at it and just oh it looks so good <laughs> so um rachel daylong well i appreciate that because yeah. now i can send her an invoice no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got you know I got to plug the people that uh, well, help sure. me. Well, sure, absolutely. You know. So do you, do you walk in sometimes and they whoever they is and mm-hmm. sometimes it varies know exactly what they want and sometimes they 
don't and you find yourself in a little bit of a consulting role? Both. Both. Yeah? Uh, there's a lot of times when people come into the studio and they'll say, after about 20 minutes, they'll go, I never realized how much there was to this. Yeah. And, you know, in today's day of uh, cell phones and iPhones and social media, uh, I mean, the photo world has changed quite a bit. I'll bet. And um, so a lot of people aren't so concerned with quality as they are with, you know, quantity of, of content because they've got to build content all the time. Ah. And it's important for companies to have a social media person to do that. But they shouldn't substitute their product photography to their social media person. I mean, yeah. it's not it's not at, at all the same thing. Um, so like one of the more recent shoots I did was uh, for Hoots, which is a uh, offshoot of Hooters, which is Hoots Wings. And I um, huh. had a really good experience with them. They came in. I had actually had two food stylists on that job. Actually, oh, I'm sorry, three. One just cooked. Wow. One just fried food out back because we didn't want to smell like big giant French fry. And we also had a video crew in um, to video, do some video for them. And because when you once you make the food, it's it's not going to last for that long a period of time. And if you're yeah. going to make it for still photography, you might as well have the videographer in there to do the things that you want um, on video as well, because right. there's that's one less cost that they have. But um, the big thing of probably about today's photography is that it's all digital. And mm. yeah, I mean, years ago, I was a film guy, you know four by five and, you know, sheet film and Polaroids. And, you know, we heard of, uh, you know, the digital uh, cameras are going to be better. And, and we never thought that that was going to happen, but eventually it did. And they are, they are really fantastic. Um, and the great thing about it is it, it brings the cost down huh. because before we'd have sheets of film, you'd have to purchase process and polaroids that you'd have to test your image you know your when you're right. when you're doing your shot you put a polaroid in and pull it and you look at it and go okay well you know this is that this is that check focus all these kind of things and all of that is gone for so for each shot you would do you'd spend about 30 or 40 dollars in processing and polaroid so when you ask, start adding that up 10 15 20 shots a day um, that gets up to be a pretty hefty bill um, I had been on a job once with a couple of friends of mine for a um, clothing company. Uh, this is back in the film days. And um, after we figured out how many images they were going to need, it was like a you know, 60, 70 page um, catalog and it was like 400 shots or something. And so somebody, we all looked at each other. Okay, who has a credit card with uh, that can put ninety thousand dollars of film and Polaroid on? <laughs> We're all like, uh, none of us. <laughs> so you know, that's a that's a huge savings to most businesses, and it and it really cheapens the cost of photography immensely. And and mm. all, now um, clients get a lot more photography done during the day in one day than they right. would have in years past because there's no film to process. There's no waiting for it to take a look at it, make sure everything's okay. And you know, instantaneously right there. And it's a big screen on your computer and you know, it's uh, it's really a, a kind of a beautiful thing to watch it really is. So how'd you get started, man? Did I, you mentioned that you went to school? Were yeah. you doing something before that or you knew pretty early on this was your path? Well, um, actually I was in the, I was in the military for a few years, um, active duty. Um, and during that period of time, my father passed away at a young age. He was uh, 48. And he was never really happy with what he had decided to do with his life. He wanted to be an actor. And um, so he um, didn't pursue acting, and he went into a career in business. Yeah. Um, and he worked for Alcoa Aluminum. Uh, for many years and we moved back and forth across the country uh, several times um but he passed away when i was 20 and i was still in the military and when i got out six months later i said you know i was trying to figure out what i wanted to do yeah and because i really didn't have a clear vision of that and i said you know i really want to do something i enjoy doing because i'm going to do it the rest of my life and i better be happy doing it and photography, which is something that had always piqued my interest that I had done when I was a little kid, a, a guy at a 
um, down the street. He was having a garage sale. He gave me a Rolly camera when I was like eight years old and I was taking pictures all over the place. And, um, and then later on in high school, I took photography classes and the, and the teacher said, Hey, you got a great eye for this. And one of the weird, one of the strange things was, um, there was in high school, you take these kind of tests that are trying to evaluate what you would do well. I, I remember that yes. test. It, it didn't say anything about uh, uh, r- running a media company. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I filled this thing out. I didn't even really look at it. And then years later, I found it as I was, you know, going through stuff when I was about to move and I had to get rid of stuff. And I found this thing and it said um, communications photography on my what How you should do. That? So it was almost like, uh, <laughs> you know, an omen. I don't know. But it was weird that, you know, those kind of things have happened and just uh, another reinforcement that this is what I was supposed to do. Have you had a mentor or mentors uh, along the way? Oh, many, many, many. Yeah. Um, Jack Eden was a big one when I first started out. Uh, a lot of photographers out in Los Angeles. Um, and then when I came here, I started working for, uh, some catalog studios, uh, quarters, mm-hmm. quarters was a big one and three score. They're, they're both gone now, unfortunately. Um, but there was always a great camaraderie in those, um, in those studios There would be anywhere from five to 40 photographers every day shooting and be like 40, 50,000 square foot spaces that, you know, everybody's trying to squeeze in and get enough equipment to do what they're going to do. But, um, everybody was very helpful and friendly. And, you know, when you had an issue, um, they would come over and help you out and say, Hey, you might want to try this. And you could go over and look at what they're doing and see their sets. And so it's a real, it was a real training ground, uh, for, um, kind of, you know, getting up your production and you had, you know, so many shots you had to do every day. And they, I mean, they range from, you know, things on what we call things on white, uh, stuff on white, so to speak, yeah. nicely put, but uh, all the way up to a huge room sets where you have uh, walls that are put up and, and held up in place and um, curtains put up, carpet laid down, uh, hardwood flooring laid down. You'd have assistants that would come and help you set all this stuff up. Um, you'd have a stylist assigned to you to help you, you know, fix the room up or whatever it was that you were doing. And it was a, it was a great learning experience. Um, a lot of great photographers. Uh, I, I guess I want to, um, point out one guy, um, Mark Perpich is, uh, one of those guys. He, he always had this ability to, no matter what he shot, it looked fantastic. And so I really um, paid attention to him a lot and what he did. But there's a lot of other people. Laura Bullock was another woman that um, uh, not not as many ladies in photography, but the ones that are there are, are really highly skilled. And Laura Bullock was one that you know taught me how to shoot glass. You know because we were shooting glassware for uh, Macy's and for Bloomingdale's. And uh, there's you know techniques to make it look really good because when you just point a light at something it's that just doesn't always do it there's reflections and all kinds of little nuances that you have to do to make something look uh, you know appealing and sexy so to speak to uh, consumers that want to purchase it so you really you really have to understand you know what you want what your client wants to be conveyed in their product and now you're mentoring others yes what what is that like Are are you you enjoying that i sense that you are Oh, it's uh, it's one of my passions. I really yeah. do enjoy it a lot, and they inspire me as much as I inspire them. They're, I mean, I what I try to do is to help them through the um, the ups and downs, and most of the downs that you know we all experience. It's just like a, yeah. a parent trying to tell a kid not to do something. Don't touch that hot stove. <laughs> but you know, they're 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 bound to do it anyway. So I press them to, like I said before, to fail all the time. And um, because through your failure, you're going to find out what to do the right way. Um, But they'll come to me with different um, ambitions of uh, shooting, different kinds of photography. Um, So sometimes they're what they want to do. I ask them, I say, well, okay, I want you to pick out, you know, 10 pictures, 10, 10 photos you see on the web or in magazines to emulate for your ah, portfolio yeah. this, you know what would you, what do you want to see in your portfolio and so they'll bring them to me and now uh, some of them are like well i would like to do this but it's just too hard you know i'm like 
Is that what you're going to tell your clients? Is it's too hard? <laughs> you know, well, I can't Good do it, you. but my friend down the street, you know, he can do it because he's better. No, you want to, you want to, like I said, practice. I mean, it's just about like everything else. It's practice, practice, practice. Um, like brain surgeons, they don't go into brain surgery right out of medical school. You know, they have to right. go through a long period of time to um, get to that level and to provide that kind of service. And there is definitely differences in, I mean, if you give a product to five different photographers, you're going to get five different shots. There's no doubt about it. We all have our own little styles and our techniques. Um, and I'm in currently trying to help pass those upon, pass those along. I, I'm in the process of writing a book um, <clears throat> all about, right. about, about photography and lighting. you got to come back when you, I, when you I get will. that book out. I will. Yeah. It's going to be called uh, Chief Cook and Bottle Washer. <laughs> Because we, you know, it was an old saying of my mother's because she always, you know, did everything around the house, of course. Right. And she's like, I'm the chief cook and bottle washer here. So anyway, I've, I I feel the same way when I'm at my studio because I'm a one man show and I hire people when I need to. Um, I keep a list of very good, strong freelance people that I hire, hire assistants and stylists and, um, all kinds of folks to come in to help me, um, put up sets, build sets, do food styling, style clothing. One of my clients is uh, USOC, the Olympic Committee. Hmm. And we do a lot of their um, uh, uh, their social media apparel. And I'll, be, I'll have three sets going on, three cameras up, uh, uh, three stylists. And they're all working their, each of their, their um, stations there. And I'm going from one to the next shooting, you know, clicking off images. Because once we get the lighting up for most of those, you know, they want to keep it consistent. And um, one of the advantages, but um, having a big enough studio to do that and have three sets going at the same time, uh, you got to keep focused. You still have everything else to worry about. You have to worry about your your stylist, you got to worry about your assistant, make sure everybody's keeping busy. You got to keep the clients happy. The art directors are there. You're trying to make sure that they're getting what they need for the project they're working on for that client. So it's, it's quite a, it's quite a show actually. I bet it is. So, there, so in your world, probably not unlike Jane's or our earlier guest, there's mastering your craft, but then you've also got to run a business. Yes. yes. <laughs> you're, uh, I mean, we're, um, we wear many hats, we wear all the hats. That's why yeah. we're cheap cook and bottle washer. <laughs> but I mean, could we do it? We have to do it all. We have to, I mean, I've, I've hired Anna here. Anna Smith is with us today. She's a marketing consultant, um, a teal marketing, and she has done a fantastic job for me with my social media stuff and really gotten my name out there. And, um, you know, it was probably the best decision I made for the longest time. I didn't really need to market myself. I had some really big clients that would keep me busy all the time, but with the uh, COVID and the changing of, mm. um, you know, social media being brought on and people think that, you know, the cell phone is going to be the end all to the sure. photography needs. Um, it, it, it came time where I had to actually get out and start, uh, hitting the bricks. So well, it was a good call for whatever my opinion is worth. Yes, I've gotten was, to know it, Anna a little bit over it, the last year. Yes, it was the best thing I've ever done, I think. <laughs> it really is. So um, let's talk legacy uh, for for a moment. Your passion just comes through, so it wouldn't surprise me to learn that you plan to do this till your last day. Uh, well, they'll probably, and, they'll probably bury me in my studio, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have any plans at all for maybe – Bringing someone in and having or or exiting in some fashion or or passing the baton or are you there yet? Um, Thinking about that stuff yet? Of course, I think about that stuff. It's difficult to find a younger person, of course, though that wants to come in and commit the kind of time necessary to um, take over the business because you know they have to have the clients uh, as well, and they've got to. My clients trust me. I mean, they come to me because it's. Yeah. What what I do for them is is I, I I work very diligently, and that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much they pay me. Some clients pay more than others, depending on usage rights. That's a whole other story. But, um, you know, I work a hundred and ten percent for that client. I will. Uh, I do the shooting. I do the retouching. I deliver the product, and um, so it's a it's a lot of work probably more work than sometimes benefit of, of um, monetary benefit, but it's just something that I love to do. I can't, I just can't help it. I've always loved it and I'm still passionate about it. 
Well, I can tell, and so can anyone listening to this to this conversation. So, what's next? Are you going to branch out into any other arena? Are you just going to stay in this lane and just get better and better and keep trying to serve more folks? Or what's on the horizon? Yes. We've got the book. Yes. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Yes, all of those things. I've um, got the book trying to come out here where um, um, it's being edited right now, and uh, – I have branched out to do. I've actually started a new thing with um, car photography. I have guys that oh, have their fancy cool. cars. They like to come yeah. into the studio. I take a nice, beautiful picture of it with them nice. in it if they want. Uh, they can hang on their wall because there's a lot of really neat cars out there, and a lot of guys uh, really enjoy that. Um, great Mother's Day or Father's Day gift for the mothers out there. And um, anyway, uh, doing that, I'm also uh, I give classes on weekends. Uh, basic photography classes. Uh, I'm planning to branch out into more uh, advanced classes, but, um, you know, I can't give away all my secrets. <laughs> so so the book is close. It's about done. We're getting close to publication. We're, we're, we're getting close. We're getting close. A couple of months, maybe. And what was that process like for you? Did it come together pretty easy? Did you struggle over pieces of it? You know, it was, I, I started writing it during the first opening salvos of of covid Mm -hmm. and it took me like maybe a couple of weeks to put it on paper wow um because it just came spilling out i've been you know i had been thinking about this for years yeah and you know as i as i work and and one of the reasons why i did this was because as my interns came in they would you know i would be setting something up and showing them how i set it up and they're like why'd you do that and i'm like well, that's a pretty good question. Why did I do that? And, and what's the difference here? And what's the difference there where I put this card or I put, you know, what kind of card I put in there, how big a card it is. And so I found myself having to articulate very specifically what I was doing because uh, we do it so naturally. After, after a time, sure. we just do it automatically. And we we don't really think about what we're doing because it's just a, a second nature. And suddenly I had to stop and go, okay, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why am I putting this here? Why am I putting that light there, or this card here? And I started to come up with, you know, ideas to help kids, uh, young photographers, to understand how light is reacting. Because it is all about light. It's not, it's not the camera. It's not, you know, photography is a study of light. So um, a camera is only as good as the person behind it. So you have to train them to see in great detail, especially in product photography, because once you take that picture, it's there. I mean, there's no, there's no getting around whatever is in that f- shot is in that shot. And you can't, uh, once it's published, you can't cover it up, you know. <laughs> so um, if there's some weird reflection in your, in your product because you didn't see it, um, it can be troubling, uh, especially to your client. Like, well, what was this? You know, what did you do that for? <laughs> I remember when I was working for Jack Eden, we, we were taking a shot of this glassware, some glassware, and there was this big blue spot in it. We're like, what is this blue spot? You know, and, and finally we realized there was a bottle of Windex sitting on, on the table across the way that was reflecting ever so slightly, but a little <laughs> sliver of blue. And so you never know where that is going to be coming from. So it's very important to be very critical of what you're doing and how you're putting things in there. Because uh, one of my basic laws that I teach uh, my students is everything reflects. Ah. Everything. It doesn't matter what it is. Everything reflects. And so you have to really understand that and understand how reflections work and in different situations and flat surfaces and in round surfaces as well. You know, I don't, a lay person, certainly not me, would never even think about that. And that's our, that's, you think about shiny things reflecting, right? right? <laughs> well, that's what our job is so that you're right. not looking at it going, oh, this, what's this photographer doing? You know, we, it's got to look great and it's got to be that thing that you're going to have in your hand that the, that the clients want want to see it can't look bad you know <laughs> and that's why there's a lot of you know funny things done to uh especially food to make it look better right um we try especially try not to um, um oversell something mm-hmm. um and, and there's also some legal ramifications uh for instance um campbell's alphabet soup you know, they used to have 
you know, a bowl of soup and you'd have the little letters, you know, writing something. Yeah, I, I rem- I'm old enough to remember, remember that. that John. Well, the, they ran into a problem because their noodles didn't float. They would sink. So they would put marbles in the plate underneath it. <laughs> oh my. And that was not ah. good. And so they said, you can't do that anymore. So now whenever you see an ad for uh, alphabet soup, it's always in a spoon. Ah. You'll see a little word in a spoon instead. And so there's little things that we, you know, that we know <laughs> in the industry that, that happen. And, um, but like if you're shooting ice cream for, let's say, carnation ice cream, I mean, you have to shoot their ice cream. Ah. You, you can't make fake ice cream. Huh. which is just powdered sugar and kiro syrup. But you you can do that if you're, you're you're just putting ice cream in as a prop. Right. That's not a problem. But ice cream is a whole different ball of wax. You're working inside of a freezer that has um, uh, dry ice lined in it. And the style is down in there and trying to oh, get it. And you have to get it really hard. And then you only have like about 20 seconds once it goes on set before it starts melting. Wow. So you have a couple of hero stand-ins that the, the stylist would make, and you get all your lighting right, and then at the last second, it's like, okay, time for the hero, and they bring that out of the freezer, and they sit it on your <laughs> um, on your set, and you go for it. So What a fascinating world. Yeah. All right, so what's the best way for someone to reach out to you, have a conversation about this, uh, probably sit down with you and talk with you a little bit about it before we book all the stuff, right? What's sure. the best way? Uh, best way is just to call me directly, 404 247 Five four five eight, and uh, you can go to my website, which is armitagephoto.com. And that's uh, an armitage is actually a lot easier than you think. It's three words: arm, it, and age, and you put them all together. <laughs> Fantastic! So, sounds like a mouthful, but it really isn't. Well, thank you for coming in and talking with us, man. This is a fascinating world. Thank you. It's been a great. Great pleasure. All right. This is Stone Payton for our guest this morning and everyone here at the Business Radio X family saying we'll see you next time on Cherokee Business Radio. (laughs) 